talk about something different, as you'll notice. We're going to talk about tattoos and birds in tents, uh, tattoos and birds in yellow tents. Um, how many of you have a tattoo? All right. Um, not as many as the school I work at, <laughs> and that's okay. So a couple, couple years ago, um, this was kind of the thing I got. Questions like this. Why did you do it? Tell me the story. Do you like it? What does your husband think? Any regrets? Oh, that's interesting. Those were some of the comments I received after getting my very first tattoo a few years ago. Now, I would have told you 10 years ago, there's no way on earth I would have gotten a tattoo. It wasn't really something that was approved in my family. It wasn't really something I thought was great because it's permanent. I didn't know where I'd put it. I wondered about what my profession and how it would look in terms of getting a job and where, um, where I would put on my body if I needed to hide it. And, and I don't want to be 60, year old, 60 years old and regret having a tattoo. But then about six years ago, my husband did something called the Ironman, which is a triathlon. And after he did that event, he decided to get a tattoo to commemorate his experience. And I'm going to show you his hairy leg here. So <clears throat> I can do this here. So this is his hairy leg. <laughs> um, and so on, you'll see on this tattoo, um, there's a little uh, swimmer, a biker, and a runner. And it says 140.6, which is the total mileage of an Ironman. It's 2.4 miles of swimming, 112 mile bike ride, and then a marathon, which is 26.2 miles. And under that, it says Isaiah 40, 31, which is a verse that he said over and over and over again in his mind through this drudgery of an event. And I was really proud of him. And I thought, well, of course you get a tattoo to commemorate something like that. I mean, maybe I should get something like that. And so I started to think, well, what should I get? Well, I've run a lot, but I've not run like that before. And, and again, I decided to talk to people. I researched tattoos like the good sociologist that I am. I wanted to understand this strange social phenomena. I wanted to understand why is it that tattoos are no longer kind of underground. They're definitely much more mainstream today. I even asked my two boys, age 11 and 14, and they said to me at that time a couple years ago, why don't you get like a sword with like a snake wrapped around it, <laughs> piercing a heart that says mom. I'm like, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and then I wanted to say, why don't you get that tattoo, son, and then come show me when you're 18 years old, piercing a heart called mom. Yeah, I don't think we're going to go there. <laughs> so I decided to dabble in a few temporary tattoos. Uh, I was living in Portland at the time, so I went downtown to Saturday Market and got a couple henna tattoos just to try it out. But it didn't really fit. <laughs> I mean, why would I get a tattoo, for goodness sakes? Am I like this you know, 39-year-old woman going through a midlife crisis, it's time to get a tattoo. And I, I thought, this is ridiculous. But then, as with most things in life, I'd spend enough time thinking about it and pondering it and questioning it that I just woke up one day, drove to the tattoo shop, and got a tattoo. Well, it wasn't quite that random. Actually, amongst all the research that I've been doing for years, I had been slowly noticing my hairdresser been, she started covering her body in tattoos. And in particular, she had an amazing sleeve tattoo that went from her wrist up to her shoulder. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful flowers and vines. It looked very much like a garden. In fact, I asked to take a picture of her arm. Here's some looks of that. And this tattoo, it, it, it kind of blew me away. For one, that she would do that to her body and that that's permanent, but, but second, that it really seemed to be a reflection of who she was. A few weeks after that, I was sitting in her chair and an older woman was sitting on the other side of the salon and chose to say under her breath, not so quietly, she used to be so beautiful. Why would she do that to herself? I was shocked. My hairdresser had obviously heard what this woman had said and was curious about what she would say then. I wondered, had her feelings been hurt? If she was gonna ignore it or if she was gonna snap back at this woman or what she was going to do. And you know what she did? She turned around and she said this, my beauty is on the inside. These tattoos were on my heart long before they ever came out on my skin. My beauty is on the inside. 
And these tattoos were on my heart long before they ever came out on my skin. I love that. It's almost as if her beautiful arm garden was simply the manifestation of her heart. And that beautiful garden had always been there. It just was a matter of time before it came out onto her skin to reveal what was in her heart. And that was it. That's why I wanted to tattoo myself. I wanted to put a physical reminder on my body that reminded me of who I am on the inside. Not for others to see, not for others to be impressed or to criticize, but for me to catch a glimpse each day of who God says that I am. So my tattoo is on my wrist. Here's a picture of it. And it simply reads, beloved. I'm the beloved of Christ always, no matter what. And every single one of us is the beloved of Christ. In fact, that's the title of this weekend's SCORE conference, coincidentally, or perhaps not so coincidentally. I think no matter who we are, at the heart of all of us, we all are the beloved of Christ. And what does it mean to be beloved? This is no uh, theological definition or anything, but I think what it means to be beloved is that we're loved and we're known. We are loved and we are known. And so I, when I look at this, again, it's not something that I, I use to show off. It's something so that I remember when I don't feel very lovable or when I've done things that I'm really, really guilty of or sorry about or ways in which I've hurt people or ways in which I do not feel like I've lived up to what God wants me to be. It doesn't matter because I remember that I am loved and I am known. And that's what I'd like to ask you today. What is your story? What is the tattoo on your heart that has yet to come out, whether you get permanent ink or not? One of the things that I know to be true about God is that all of us actually have the same tattoo on our heart. And I believe that same tattoo, if you were to write it out in script, it would say, love God and love others, period. Love God and love others. That seems really easy, but I would say it's actually one of the hardest things to do today in our world. It's especially hard when we're asked to love people who are different than us, who intimidate us, who have different values than us, who do things that we don't agree with. That's really hard because we've all been taught things from our families about groups of people perhaps to stay away from or to not trust, whether that be based on their race or their sexuality or their religion or even what part of town they're from. I remember being told what part of town not to go to growing up. And I don't think my parents did that to instill fear in me. It's because they loved me and they wanted to protect me. But again, that kind of message of stay away but that's really difficult to talk about because here we are on this amazing campus. And I gotta tell you class, or class folks, <laughs> oh, where am I? <laughs> no, I gotta tell you, like I've been in Christian higher ed for 11 years. I, I worked at George Fox up until about six months ago. And that's where I started my career, right out of graduate school. I went into a Christian environment, and now I am in a not Christian environment at a state school way up in the Rocky Mountains. And most of the kids up there come from, uh, I, I mean, come from very diverse backgrounds, number one. You know what's legal in Colorado, so we can just kind of stop there. <laughs> I live 30 minutes from a world-class ski resort, so the, when we get fresh powder, you can understand what happens. In this place where I cannot talk about my faith out loud, I cannot mention how my faith and my scholarship go together. I can't do that. Do you know how many opportunities I have had to share my faith in ways that I never have been asked to share before? In kids, students talking with me, me talking with them and hearing their stories. You know, it's the same kind of stories that you all have here but it's, it's not shrouded in this kind of sense of, I gotta be polite, I gotta be careful. I mean, there's kids that are just right out telling me, like, I totally disagree with what you're saying. Or Christians, Christians are, as one student told me last week, Christians are whack. 
whacked, whacked. I don't know what he said, whack, whacked. <laughs> Wacky night, I whacked. Christians are whacked. They're so hypocritical. They're so hypocritical. I don't believe in that stuff. I'm an atheist. I love that. I love that opportunity to have that conversation. So you know what, sometimes I think Christians are whack too. But let me tell you my experience. And, and I think what, I, what I've learned is that being in Christian higher ed has been a blessing in my life because it's a place where I can come right out and say, I love God, I love sociology, and I love being a Christian sociologist. But now I'm with people that are so different than me, it's not a comfortable environment in a lot of ways. And I'm having to break those stereotypes that I have in order to share what I feel. You know, when I pray each morning, it's God, help me to show you off today. (laughs) Help me to show you off because I can't do it alone. So I don't like to admit that I have stereotypes, that I have fear, that I have hesitancy to be around people that are so different than me, but the truth is I'm broken. I have a lot of baggage and junk that I can easily project onto others without really any good reason. When someone comes up to me and says, I think Christians are crazy, I think they're a bunch of hypocrites, my first reaction is to say, no, we're not. You're a hypocrite. (laughs) That wouldn't be very mature. But instead, I get to remember that I'm the beloved in Christ first and foremost, and I have the freedom to share God's beauty To me, it's a story of God's view of who we are. And I wanna tell you real quickly about a man, which I probably think some of you may have read this book. It's a book called Tattoos on the Heart by um, Reverend George Boyle, right? This is a guy, excuse me, not George, Gregory Boyle. Here's this guy, he's a Jesuit priest, he's white, he's middle-aged, where does he live? He lives in uh, the Boyle Heights neighborhood outside of LA, really close to here. He started an organization called Homeboy Industries. This is an organization that is meant to rehabilitate kids off the streets and into places of employment and places of love. It's a place to be in a therapeutic environment. It's an awesome book. What he says in the opening, he says this, clearly the themes that bind the stories together that I'm about to tell you, they matter to me. As a Jesuit for 37 years and a priest for 25 years, it would not be possible for me to present these stories apart from God, Jesus, compassion, kinship, redemption, mercy, and our common call to delight in one another. If there's a fundamental challenge within these stories, it is simply to change our lurking suspicion that some lives matter less than other lives. William Blake wrote, quote, we are put on earth for a little space, just a little space that we might learn to bear the beams of love, unquote. Turns out, Boyle says, this is what we all have in common. Gang members, non-gang members, we're just trying to learn how to bear the beams of love. Homeboy Industries is a place that I want to visit. It's a place that I want to I wanna see what Boyle's doing. And I think it's ironic that his last name is Boyle and he works in Boyle Heights. So I have a question for you. What is your tattoo class? What's been tattooed onto your heart? What is it about you that makes you different from everyone else? But not only you, not just you, if we all in this room had the same tattoo on our hearts, what would it be? If the Biola community had a tattoo, what would it be? And I'm not talking about your motto. I'm not talking about your mascot. What are the things that identify you as followers of Christ that are willing and ready to love others that are different, scary, strange, wonderful? Is there anything about you as a whole, as a community, that when students become a part of Biola, that over time, they would begin to recognize Biola has this one tattoo? I do know one thing about this place. It seems to be, and I was here last year and I've been here again the last couple days. It seems to be a place where you don't just check in on Sundays with God. You're actually being challenged to do the living as transformed and transforming people side by side. Biola students in your dorm rooms, 
in your places of hanging out, in your classrooms, the buildings that you will walk in and out of every day, those are your spiritual workplaces. The place where the whole follow Christ thing gets worked on every day. This place, whether you're a senior or a freshman, will be a place where your tattoo can leave a mark. A place where you will truly believe that no life matters more or less than another. I want to tell you a, another story. My family and I are a bit on the wild side. So see, being that I'm the only woman in my family, let's just say that has its upsides and its downsides. One of the things I love about being the only woman in my family is oftentimes I will sit down to dinner with my family and I'll get a slow clap. Slow clap is this. Let's give it up for mom. Slow, 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 slow. Clap, 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 clap. Right? That's like, that's a good moment in my life. Let's give it up for slow clap, fast clap, mom. But there's other things I don't like about being the only woman in my family. Like these men do not know where to aim. They don't know how to aim. It's all over the place. I can't teach them. <laughs> so I look to my husband and I say, uh, never mind, you can't teach them either. But one thing I do also love about this family being the only woman is that I have been introduced to the world of grit and grime and disgustingness. And there's something special about that, right? How many of you have ever like not taken a shower for days? Just like purposely or not, not on purpose? right? I'm not suggesting you do that, especially if you're sitting next to your boyfriend or girlfriend right now. You can check it out. So when I married this kid, he told me one thing that uh, you're going to learn about me is I like to sleep in the dirt. And I said, I'm not sleeping in the dirt. He says, we're going to sleep in the dirt. I said, you're going to get me a pad about this inch before I sleep in the dirt. He said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> so for the past eight years, we have spent the majority of our summers traveling and sure we've done the Disneylands and we've, done, we've gone to Mexico a few times and it's been wonderful, but really what we like to do is we like to go to places like this, Rocky Mountain National Park, Yosemite, uh, what do we have here? Sequoia National Park, Canyonlands, Capitol Reef, Bryce Canyon, Zion, you see a trend? Yellowstone National Park, Olympic National Park, Glacier National Park. So, so it's this like nas national park theme. Can you see that? <laughs> and so last summer in particular, we went on a two and a half month, two and a half month national park tour. Months in the dirt, not necessarily my favorite thing. Months, two and a half months. I just gotta say that again. <laughs> Last summer, we hiked over 76 miles. Why do I know this? Because I wore a watch to make sure I could prove to my husband that I can, in fact, do these things. So last summer, before we went on this two and a half mile or two and a half month trip, we decided to get a really nice tent. So we went to REI and we bought a really nice REI dome tent, um, not the kind that sits up real tall, it's real low to the ground so it doesn't blow over, and we bought a bright yellow tent. Now little did I know that is the wrong color tent to buy, and why do I know this? We were in the Olympic National Forest camping. And we set up our tent and we went away for a hike. And when we came back, we noticed once we got into the tent, there's bugs like everywhere, not in the tent, but between the tent and the fly, right? Bugs everywhere, bees, flies, strange things. Didn't think anything of it, kind of batted them off. Later that day, we came back to the tent, more bugs. Do you know why all these bugs were there? It was a giant flower. <laughs> it was a giant flower to these bugs, this yellow tent. So we thought, well, that's interesting. This is kind of fun. No, it's not fun, because they don't go away. The next morning we wake up and I hear my son go, mom, 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 there's a bird, there's a bird. He has a very big phobia of birds. Mom, there's a bird, and sure enough, in between the tent and the fly was a bird, and it, she was stuck, and she was pooping everywhere. <laughs> Poop, falling, I mean, 
flapping, like going crazy, going crazy. And my son is literally shaking because he's so, I don't know why, he's like this big kid and he's afraid of birds, right? <laughs> Mom, I can't, Mom, bird. <laughs> so Jeff, my husband, get the bird. I'm not getting the bird, you get the bird. Caleb's like hyperventilating about to pass out. Get the bird, I'm not getting the bird. So my youngest son, who was like 10, he's like, I'll get the bird. <laughs> So he goes outside and we're all huddled like, it's gonna kill us because it's pooping and she's scared and whatever. So he goes out and he takes the fly off the tent. And what do you think we thought would happen? The bird would fly away. But she just sat there, still. Like for the first time, she just sat there and I thought maybe she's stunned. You know how sometimes when you hit something, it stuns, you know, kind of like that happens to us, right? She just sat there. And she just kind of looked around in her bird sort of way. <laughs> just kind of looking around. And we're all just kind of like, this is weird. And my scared son's like, fly away, go away. <laughs> and she just sat there enough that all of us got out of the tent and we just looked at her. We didn't touch her. because You're not supposed to do that in national parks. You do not touch or feed the animals, by the way. I don't know how long she sat there, but she just sat there and she kind of walked, she stopped pooping. She started kind of just walking around. Two minutes she sat there and then she flew away. It was the strangest thing. After thinking about that experience, I thought, you know what, I wonder if we're kind of like that little bird. We all find ourselves, don't we, drawn to a place or a person or an experience and at first it scares us or it makes us panic or it makes us throw us off guard but really once we recognize that that is a safe place, it's new and it's different and it's curious and it's exciting, we want to stay, we want to hold on. We want to become a part of something new and isn't that what college is all about. Like when you grabbed onto that tent called Biola and they put the tarp over you and I don't know, some of you were like, get me out of here. And then after a while you stayed because there was something about this place that caught your attention. Or there's a person that you met that caught your attention or something that scared you or something that made you feel uncomfortable that caught your attention. And sometimes the most important things make us uncomfortable. My guess is you're here for some of those reasons, something about this place, whether it was a visit to campus, a conversation with a Biola admissions counselor, a meeting with a professor, getting a letter in the mail, or because your girlfriend or boyfriend goes here or doesn't go here for that matter. But the truth is you're here, you're on the yellow tent and it's bright and it's attractive. And I want to assure you that you are here at this time, at this place for a reason. This weekend, whether you're going to score or not, which I highly recommend, grab onto that yellow tent and just find out what it is about. Maybe feel a little uncomfortable or maybe actually you'll feel right at home. In your classrooms, when your professors ask you something that you maybe don't understand or have never heard or have never thought about, hold on to that yellow tent. When you're in a conversation with someone that is very different than you and you don't understand what they're saying or where they're coming from, hold on to that yellow tent. Because my guess is that yellow tent, that conversation, that classroom, that workshop that you go to this weekend, it will be a place of joy and freedom, and that's a good thing. I don't know what lies ahead for you this weekend, this semester, or for the rest of the year. My guess is that there will be beauty and some hurt. My guess is there will be beauty and there will be hurt. But Biola exists to be a place that lives out compassion, lives out justice, lives out faith, lives out redemption, and lives out grace. So here's your assignment, because I think I've accidentally called you class now twice. <laughs> I want you to think about what's tattooed on your heart right now. I figured out what mine was. 
What will be tattooed on your heart four years from now, if you're a freshman? Three months from now, if you're a senior? Five years from now, 10 years from now, what is that tattoo on your heart? And this time next year, wherever you are, my hope is that you'll be more effective and fruitful than you are today. This is your job. And by the way, no skin art is required. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.